Hello, this is Annick Smith with Dogwood Ridge Bees from Boonville, Indiana. And we are here today at the North American Honey Bee Expo in Louisville, Kentucky. And we would like to welcome you to the Beekeeping Today podcast. Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Better Bee, your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Becky Masterman. Today's episode is brought to you by the Bee Nutrition Superheroes at Global Patties. Family operated and buzzing with passion, Global Patties crafts protein packed patties that'll turn your hives into powerhouse production. Picture this strong colonies, booming brood, and honey flowing like a sweet river. It's super protein for your bees, and they love it. Check out their buffet of patties tailor-made for your bees in your specific area. Head over to www.globalpatties.com and give your bees the nutrition they deserve. Hey, a quick shout out to all of our sponsors whose support allows us to bring you this podcast each week without resorting to a fee-based subscription. We don't want that and we know you don't either. Be sure to check out all of our content on the website. There, you can read up on all of our guests, read our blog on the various aspects and observations about beekeeping, search for, download, and listen to over 250 past episodes, read episode transcripts, leave comments and feedback on each episode, and check on podcast specials from our sponsors. You can find it all at www.beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. Thanks a lot, Nick, for that great opening. I remember talking to her in Louisville. That was fantastic. At the North American Hunting Bee Expo, we have another state to color in. Yeah, the Midwest is looking pretty good on this map. So that conference was a long time ago. Are you running out of listener openings yet <laughs> from it? Oh, I thought you were going to say something else. Like, how many do you have in that bucket? Of- <laughs> You know, we are coming up to the end of our uh, North American Honeybee Expo visitors who gave us an opening. If someone would like to open our show for us, boy, we could use that. You can record and send us an opening at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. And if you need a reminder, you can check out our fantastic newsletter that Becky prepares for us every week. Newsletter? We haven't told anybody about the newsletter. Are you letting the newsletter out of the mailbag (laughs) so it's no longer a secret because that's the first on-air mention of the newsletter you've been spearheading that for the last six months at least we have we have it's fantastic it's nice to be able to communicate with people in a different way you know we're able to maybe add some more timely information to the newsletter and also share honeybee obscura podcast episodes, as well as 2 Million Blossom episodes. And occasionally some messages from our sponsors, too. So I encourage folks, if you're not getting, receiving the newsletter, to go to our website and sign up today. Fantastic. Becky, what was your first piece of beekeeping equipment that you purchased? Don't say a hive tool. Okay, I won't say a hive tool, although it probably was. I think the first piece of equipment (laughs) was an actual set of equipment to house the bees. So 10 frame Langstroth boxes. So let me back up. Let me rephrase my question, please. What was the first piece of extracting equipment you ever purchased? Oh, the first piece of extracting equipment. My husband bought me an extractor. So he surprised me with it. So I bought the components, the strainer, uncapper, but not an electronic uncapper. I'm not that fancy. But my husband bought me an extractor. I think he was just afraid that if he didn't buy me something that I could plug in and do, he would be recruited to help me extract all that honey. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Or, or you'd be left to your own devices and get something that you really caught your there, Oh, there you go. There you go. So, no, so he surprised me with it. What about you? You've got a, you've got a nice setup there, don't you? Well, I have a nice setup today, and it's, it's been a long time coming. But my very first piece of equipment was an old Daydant Ranger-powered extractor that I received for Christmas years and years ago. It was fantastic. I thought I was king of the world. It was a great Christmas gift. Did you play a role in picking out the gift? I don't recall that part of it. 
But knowing me, I probably left the big, big tents around. <laughs> like model numbers, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> things like that. Right. The magazines laying out, open, circled. I had borrowed other people's extractors, uh, manual extractors. Never used a powered extractor up until that Ranger. So it was fantastic. The reason I bring it up is today's guest, John Hill from Hill Equipment, will be joining us. And he is a new player in the stainless circle of beekeeping equipment. And he's really making waves. So I, I thought it'd be really interesting to talk to him about what they're doing. That sounds like a really good conversation that's pretty timely considering the time of year right now. <laughs> it sure is. I'm looking forward to talking to John. But before we get to John, we have a new feature. We're starting today with Dr. Dewey Karen, who many of our listeners may know from his many books or many speaking engagements. Dewey joins us today with a new monthly audio postcard that he will bring us exploring all things honeybees. This month, the topic is communication. Hello, this is Dewey Karen. Today, I like to do an audio postcard about communication. Our busy spring, that is roughly defined as the first day of spring to the first uh, day of summer, is uh, uh, extremely occupied with our honeybee activity. So today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about communication. Communication of bee scientist to beekeeper, beekeeper to bees, and bees to bees. Communication, bee scientist to beekeeper. We have a fascinating book, one in a series from Dr. Tom Seeley. The name of the book, the title of the book is Piping Hot Bees and Boisterous Buzz Runners. It's from Princeton University Press and just recently released. Listeners may recall that Dr. Seeley was on Beekeeping Today podcast, April 1st, no fooling, April 1st, where he talked finally about this book. The book includes 20 chapters, which are really a recounting of the work that he's been doing over his professional life at uh, Cornell University, investigating aspects of bees and bee behavior. Nearly half the chapters cover some particular aspect about swarming. The title refers to two of those chapters, Chapter 6, Piping Hot Bees, and Chapter 7, Boisterous Buzz Runners. The book is a very easy read, but it is important, I think, for understanding what we do as bee scientists. Tom takes you through a tale of how he became interested in a particular topic, in this case, how bees are able to get ready to go with a swarm, that's the piping hot bees chapter, and how they then get the message to leave home with the swarm. That's the boisterous buzz runners. In each of the chapters, besides introducing and then introducing his experiments, he walks us, us through the experiments of how he was able to set up and actually find out information from the bees to be able to communicate with the bees, have the bees tell him in an experiment what he would like to know relative to a particular topic. And as I indicated in this case, how bees get messages about getting ready to swarm and then eventually leaving. Each of the chapters feature very simple but very elegant illustrations. And also, uh, in most of the chapters, there is a graphic of actually of the information that he presents. Swarming, it's a big topic. Lots of different aspects of bees and bee behavior. I recommend Piping Hot Bees and Boisterous Buzz Runners from scientist Tom Seeley to us as beekeepers. Beekeeper to bee communication. In the uh, spring quadrant, that is that first day of spring to the first day of summer, one of the uh, activities as beekeepers that we need to consider if we're trying to gather honey, uh, honey that we might then be able to harvest from our bees, is the behavior, the management of supering. So supering is to add a box or boxes above the a part of the hive for the bees above the brood area. Sometimes we'll use a queen excluder, sometimes not. 
Uh, sometimes we'll put one or more supers on initially. Sometimes we'll put an initial super on and put additional supers on. And the way we put the additional supers on, we might put them on the top. We might put them right above the queen excluder, which sometimes we then take off, or we might bait the supers. But what we are doing with supering is we are, we are communicating to our bees an expectation. We want the bees to take the incoming nectar that the foragers are bringing into their home, into the hive, and put that above the brood area, the area where the bees are rearing their, their young and storing the resources for the young, storing the bee bread and some nectar stored there so that they can feed their young. We have the expectation that with supers, they're going to store surplus. They're going to store extra honey that we then might be able to harvest. So there are a number of different ways in which we might approach supering. But the major aspect that we need to do is communicate. We need to let the bees know what our expectation is. We expect that they're going to store surplus, surplus that we can then eventually harvest from them. And we do that in the way that we might super. Although the techniques may vary, we are basically telling our bees, ladies, this is where we expect you to put extra nectar so that we're going to be able to get something back, get something in return, our harvest for our efforts in keeping you in a, in a nice, warm, and, and a dry domicile and managing you through the season. Communication. Communication of bees to bees is critical as well. The beehive is a dark, smelly, hot, humid place. So, so how, how do bees talk to each other? How do they communicate? They have a number of ways that they can do it. A new, relatively new publication out of some researchers in England, references references supplied, talks about how important one bee facing another bee and using their antennae is to bee communication in that hot, dark, smelly, humid hive. By attenuation, by one bee touching other bees with antenna, they are able to communicate a number of different aspects. For example, trophile laps, the movement of honey from or nectar uh, crop and honey stomach co contents from one bee to another is through antennal contact. But this paper features the dancing, dance language of honeybees. So when a forager comes back and wants to tell her sisters about a great resource out there, she can do a dance. How do bees then get the information out of the dance? They get it by touching or sensing a sound that the dancing bee has made with their antennae. The bee that is dancing is moving wildly among bees in somewhat of a pattern, and no one bee can follow her directly. So with a bit of uh, touching that dancing bee with their antenna and using their antenna to know where they are relative to gravity, bees are able to then pick up the information from the dancing bees and then use it. And it's critical that they have that information because they only take enough crop contents to get out to the source and get back. They don't actually feed in the, in the, in the field. So this dance language is critical for telling other bees where sources are and how rich they are, uh, what they smell like, and, and where they're located, specifically where they're located. And by using antenna, one bee then is able to pick up that information. Communication, antenna to antenna. Today's topics then, communication, swarming, supering, and dancing. Thank you, and I hope you found this of interest. Strong Microbials presents an exciting new product, Superfuel, the probiotic fondant that serves as nectar on demand for our honeybees. Superfuel is powered by three remarkable bacteria known as bacilli, supporting bees in breaking down complex substances for easy digestion and nutrient absorption. This special energy source provides all the essential amino acids, nutrients, polyphenols, and bioflavonoids, just like natural flower nectar. 
vital for the bee's nutrition and overall health, Superfuel is the optimal feed for dearth periods, over winter survival, or whenever supplemental feeding is needed. The big plus is the patties do not get hive beetle larvae, so it offers all bioavailable nutrients without any waste. Visit strongmicrobials.com now to discover more about Superfuel and get your probiotic fondant today. Hey, thanks a lot, Strong Microbials. And while you're at their website, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, the regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. Sitting across the big virtual Beekeeping Today podcast table is John Hill from Hillco. You may know him from all the extractors and beekeeping equipment that he makes there in Manilk, Illinois. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jeff. Great to be here. Nice to meet you, John. Thank you, Becky. Likewise. I invited you to the show because, well, number one, you are a new player, a relatively new news, news a relative term, but a new player in the beekeeping supply equipment company. And secondarily, at the North American Honeybee Expo in January, I swear to goodness, your booth had the most foot traffic than anybody else. If there was one other person, there might have been only one other person. I don't even know. But you had the most foot traffic. And you had the foresight to bring in a bunch of carts that every beekeeper that had a stash of booty that they had bought along the way was pushing it along on a John Hill, Hillco <laughs> cart. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this guy is on top of his game. Well, yeah, we try. We try. And that, uh, you know, we don't always get it right. But that that conference is something that we put a tremendous amount of effort into and, and, and money, frankly, you know, we put a lot of investment into that as well. And it pays off, though, you know, and we're it's really, really exciting to see the way people are embracing what we're doing, especially at that event. We don't want to come in second place if we can help it. So that event, we really try to be be the best that we can be. And we, again, we put a ton of effort into it. I mean, even for this up, you know, for the next one in 2025, the expo, you know, we're already, we've been, we were, we started planning for that on basically, you know, January 7th or whatever the last day of the conference was <laughs> this year, we're planning for next year. And every day we think about it really. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, but uh, yeah, those carts were a big hit and we plan to bring them back bigger and better than ever next year. So you better bring them back motorized, I suppose. <laughs> maybe, maybe not, but we'll see. <laughs> You'd need extra insurance if you're going to go that route. Yeah, right, right, right. Before we get more marketing tips, I think we need to get John Hill's beginning story. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I, I'm just going to say it because I think you two are just going to go down this road and we're not going to be able to pull you back. So, John, can you tell us how you got started in beekeeping Thanks, and how Becky. you ended up with a company? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So I got started in beekeeping in 2005, I believe it is. I was 16 years old. I just, yeah, I just, I don't know. My family was traveling in Florida, saw a lot of beehives and orange groves in different places down there. And I had read an article in some homesteading magazine, I think, that my folks subscribed to. And I just, even as I, even, even further back than that, I remember at four or five years old seeing a uh, sign for, and it's just my vague memory from 30 years ago, but seeing a, a sign for honey at some place and somehow either my assumption or maybe it was the way it was, maybe I had real reason to believe this, but I remember like being a, a, a board fence with a sign about honey and like there was an apiary in behind that fence was at least in my imagination. And I just remember being really fascinated. And again, four or five years old, we were visiting somebody. I saw this sign on this fence and, and somehow just this mysteriousness of, of, of beehives being behind that fence, you know, and it was a really <laughs> intriguing to me to think about. So, you know, again, fast forward 10 or 12 years, I was about 16. Again, saw some beehives in Florida, different places, read this article, I was really intrigued, really excited to get into it. Read every book I could get a hold of, you know, order in cattle from all the different bee suppliers and, you know, read these catalogs, got real familiar with the terminology and the equipment and beekeeping in general. You know, I, I borrowed and we just, we live in a very small, actually, I grew up in this town of Monunk, Illinois, where we run our business now. And the library is actually basically right next door to where we run our business now, the old bread bakery that we remodel and, and run our business. And now the, the library is right next door. As a kid, I would go to the library a lot. We had one beekeeping book there and uh, <laughs> it was an, old, an old 1970s version of ABC XYZ of bee culture, you know, that, that Dan Ann has put out many times over the years. And I borrowed that book as many, you know, so many different times. I kept renewing it or I'd have to take it back sometimes, you know, before I could <laughs> renew it again. And, 
And I actually, a cool thing, I, I actually went to that library here a year or two ago. I think it was last summer. And I and sure enough, they still had that that same exact book, the very same one I had, <laughs> I had borrowed. And uh, so I said, hey, can I take, can I, can I, can I replace this book? Can I buy the latest version of ABC, XYZ, B culture, give it, donate to the library and, and you guys rotate this one out and give it to me. I'd really like to have this book. And sure enough, it took a month or so for their process, but we did that. So I have that book now. It reminds me of a story similar, but not quite the same. I also collected books, a lot of insect books. My sister-in-law went there not so long ago the librarian said, are you related to Jeff Ott? And my sister-in-law said, well, yes, he's my brother-in-law. And she said, well, he has outstanding finds from a book, How to Follow Insects, from you know, back in the 70s. <laughs> and my sister-in-law had to pay the fine. Anyway. Oh, oh no. <laughs> By 30 years of fines, huh? Well, they, they only did it for so many, but oh, yeah, okay. it was okay. funny. Yours had a better ending. Uh, I think that that's <laughs> nice that you did that. I had an ulterior motive there. I certainly wanted that book for myself, kind of for a collector. It was an important part of how we got started on this journey. But yeah, so anyway, as as back to my high school days there. And so, yeah, and then I think that's that, that summer maybe of, uh, I think it was again, 2005. I Some people here in town, in very small town, some people I knew here in town, they farmed outside outside of town here. And they heard I was I was getting into bees and I was passionately interested in beekeeping and studying up on it. And they called me up one evening in June, I think it was. And uh, hey, we got a swarm of bees in our backyard here. And so I didn't have any equipment yet at this point, but I knew another beekeeper who lived south of town here and I called him up and went out there. He loaned me a, a hive box, a deep box that he had sitting there. We didn't have, he didn't have any extra bottom boards or lids. So I, we, I think we used plywood for the lid and bottom board. It just had a box with frames in it. And we found it, used a mason jar for a feeder or something probably and got this swarm hive, got it home. I was on cloud nine, you know, I, mean, I was really, <laughs> really, really excited. And so then ended up, you know, getting better equipped over time. And, and uh, as a kid there, you know, I kept grand bees for about the next several years after that. So I was in my early twenties, maybe 22, 23, you know, got up to never got more than 15, 15 hives or so probably. And then got out of them for a few years. Guess we were living in town at the time. I'd been gotten married, started having kids, just got too busy. And so got out of beekeeping for a few more years. And then, and then in 2018, we moved to where we live now. It's a couple acres around El Paso, Illinois, just the next town south where we run the business here. So we had a couple acres there kind of in the country and a lady from our church was doing some beekeeping, had a couple of hives and she got stung a few times. She kind of thought she was maybe allergic somewhat. So she reached out to me, said, do you want to buy these hives? I was, oh, absolutely. I was all over that. Now I had a place to put them, you know? And so I got back in again, that was the summer of 2018. Pretty much right away, I got back, I dove right back into it. I, I kind of always wanted to, from, from my high school days on up, I had kind of always wanted to be self-employed someday. At the time I was working for a lumberyard, and I wanted to be self-employed and I wanted to, I wanted beekeeping to be part of that in some form or fashion. It was part of my living, part of the whole thing, whatever. I wanted beekeeping to be part of my future self-employment plan. So I started splitting, splitting these hives and kind of really getting rolling on it. I, again, I was working on a lumber yard, had no woodworking background, but I, man, you can learn anything from YouTube. So I looked up on YouTube, <laughs> you know, how to build a beehive. And this guy, you know, a simple video, he used a simple cheap table saw and cut you know, a hive box, simple hive box and a simple migratory lid, a simple bottom board out of basically a, a couple, a couple of pieces of one by 12, you know? So, well, I work in this lumber yard, I can buy lumber and employee discount, you know? And so I started taking home boards. I had an old table saw at home. I'd never used it was, I had bought it for five bucks on a whim at an auction, an old home built table saw <laughs> and uh, started cutting some boxes and they were crude. I still have one of my kind of kept as a keepsake but they were functional, you know, and so I, so I made a few migratory lids out of plywood and things like that. And over the next year, I started studying up on finger joining and how to cut better handles and stuff and got kind of kept morphing into a better hive box until I thought I had a halfway decent box that I could maybe market. And again, at the time I was kind of working towards commercial beekeeping. That was my, that was my goal, whether I had to, whether I was going to sell sell bees, nukes, queens, you know, honey, whatever it took to make a living. And uh, however many hives I got, I had to get to before I can make a living at it. That was where I was working towards. And so 
And I thought, but I thought, man, I'm getting better at making these boxes. Maybe I'll go ahead and market some of these boxes here locally on Facebook or whatever and see if some local beekeepers want some of these, some of this woodenware I was making for myself, an extra way, you know, another way to bring in a little bit of extra income to kind of boost the whole project. And by the way, I'm also an auctioneer part time. So <laughs> you may know. I was getting a sense of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I get a little long with and I talk fast. Um, <laughs> so, but anyway. So, yeah. Yeah, towards the, this is like later in 2019. I start, yeah, I was again getting better set up. I was my father-in-law and I. My father-in-law has been an integral part of what we've done here. He's he's just he's kind of a he was a mechanic for 47 years. Uh, he's just got a real engineering mind, very very sharp guy, and so he's been a huge help to us as we've gotten started here. And this is even today, I mean, still we've you know he's very involved in design of the special electro, electro electronic stuff. And I'll get back to that later. But so he and I were working on building a machine to 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 cut finger joints in hive boxes. And that was kind of a colossal failure. Basically, by by the beginning of 2020, by January 2020, we launched our Hillco website. All we had on there was a couple different sizes of hive boxes, eight and ten frame deeps and mediums. I think I had Pureco. Within a couple of weeks, I was bringing in Pureco or Acorn one piece frames. I was starting to make lids and bottom boards out of PVC. We just kind of launched this website. I started attending a couple of local bee club meetings and spreading the word. Hey, we're doing some a little bit of equipment up here. We realized real fast that people in the local area around here there was an appetite for a local supplier, and so. Almost immediately, you know, I started working towards, you know, doing, I still was planning to kind of do bees full, you know, commercial beekeeping to some level as well as supplies. At that time, selling bee equipment was not necessarily the top of my list for what I was looking to do, but I saw potential there. At the same time, and I know we're going to get to the China thing here later, maybe, but at the same time, I was looking for a honey extractor for myself. And yeah, I wasn't really finding what I liked as far as price point or size and stuff here in the U.S. market. And so I started looking at China to see what they had over there. I was just really interested at the time in one in a honey extractor for myself. Maybe I'd buy a few and sell some off. So I'd had mine for cheaper or free or whatever, using the profits from the other machines. So again, this was in the fall of 2019. I got some money together and ordered a dozen honey extractors from China. And those, so in the media, so that was all going on. I was kind of waiting on those in the meantime, as I'm getting this website started off in January of 20 and starting to get a little bit of traction here in the local area in January and February. By March of 2020, my first shipment of 10 or 12 extractors had come in. I looked them over. I was kind of impressed. Really, there was some, you know, they overall looked pretty well built and there's some design things I would have changed, but overall they looked quite good. And so a couple months later, I finally got around to it. I'm still working a full-time job through it in this time, obviously. And so I'm making hive boxes as fast as I can and shipping a few and mostly selling to local beekeepers. And by May, I think I finally got around to taking pictures of these honey extractors and listing them on the little website we had at the time and putting them on Facebook Marketplace. Boy, this first batch sold was, most of them were sold out in a, free, in a few days. And so I thought, oh, wow, we're, we're on to something here, you know? And so we got some more money together, ordered a whole shipment or a whole container of extractors that came in in July. And then even before those had come in, I was still getting enough inquiries, enough interest. I ordered another shipment to sell that didn't come in until October. But so this whole summer, I, I went full time at it then in July of 2020. You know, we're making boxes, building building bottom boards and lids and such. I was getting my frames elsewhere. We're selling woodenware and starting to ship it, starting to really gain some traction with these honey extractors. Pretty soon, somewhere in the summer of 2020, I got up to maybe 50 hives or so. That was as, as big as I ever got it as far as my beekeeping. But uh, I realized pretty quickly that there was a lot of opportunity in this bee supply industry, especially with the stainless steel honey extracting products. And so I started to kind of move in that direction pretty quickly. And so I've never gotten above about 50 hives. Right now, I run about 10. That's usually I've been the past few years, about six to 10 hives. I'm kind of go up and down as I sell off a few nukes locally or whatever. But anyway. 2020 is when you really decided to turn the corner and really focus on the equipment side of the beekeeping supplies. Correct. Yep. Yep. And you're still manufacturing the boxes? And no, we're not. We have two manufacturers here in the U.S. One is in Michigan, and one is in Southern Illinois, and we use both of those as our as our as our sources for woodenware. We're not manufacturing. We do quite a bit of assembly here. Some assembly, some not. Some comes pre-assembled. Speaking of equipment suppliers, let's take this quick break, and we'll be right back. 
Just a quick reminder, Varroa mites might be lurking on your bees even if you can't see them. Protecting your colonies means actively combating these mites, the leading cause of colony death. The good news? There are plenty of natural methods and treatments available to keep those mite counts in check. Learn about different monitoring techniques at betterbee.com forward slash mites. Are you a smart beekeeper looking to stay ahead of the curve? Introducing Bee Smart Designs, the ultimate line of innovative, modular, and interchangeable hive system and cool tools. As a listener of the Beekeeping Today podcast, you understand the importance of staying informed on the latest advancements in beekeeping. This is where BeeSmart System comes in. Designed with you and your bees in mind, our core hive system works with all standard Langstroth equipment and is 8 and 10 frame compatible. Made in the USA, using recycled and American sourced materials, our products are ready to use. Visit BeSmartDesigns.com to explore our groundbreaking offerings and links to your favorite dealer. Be Smart Designs, next generation beekeeping products for the modern beekeeper. Welcome back, everybody. John, that was an incredible amount of information. And I got the cadence of the auctioneer in there. It was very easy to listen to and easy to follow. I understood all of it. Thank you. Good. <laughs> but, but it's interesting because you, you told the story of ramping up so quickly and you ramped up because you are engaging in multiple streams of income, I think. It seems like you're doing a little bit of bee work you're selling equipment. You're selling packages too, aren't you? Packages and nukes. What prepared you to be able to put all of this together? Because you're juggling a lot of different components of the beekeeping industry. And it sounds like you're doing it well. Well, we have a lot of room to grow, but we're trying. Thank you. But yeah, I've been blessed with a really diverse background. Uh, so first of all, we have a great team. I want to be really careful there and, and, and acknowledge that first of all, I want to acknowledge God and, and his and his blessing on what we've done, but also he's a, he's put a great team of people around me. And early on, I mentioned my father-in-law, who again was really really instrumental early on, and still is very instrumental today. My wife as well, you know, my kids even, you know, my kids now are twelve down to seven years old. I have four kids. At the time, they were quite a bit younger, eight down to three or four, I guess. But anyway, so they were they were with me from day one there, you know, a really, really powerful part of this. But even earlier on in that, as a kid, my family had a business, a hardware supply business. I was fortunate to work in the agriculture industry and in a farm equipment dealership for eight years. And I spent four years managing a couple different lumber yards. And so I've really been blessed with a lot of opportunity to learn a lot of different things business-wise, that really has helped me get to a rant. And honestly, every day now is in the last four years has been a wild roller coaster. I've learned so much, still learn so, so much every day. And so, yeah, but again, a great team and just a lot of learning experiences that have been a, a lot of fun most of the time, but also it's a struggle some days, but it's just been a, a, a real adventure. You can be really good at sourcing and shipping and understanding what people want to buy. But if you're not good at marketing, then nobody's going to, know what you're selling. So you've really been able to pull it together, especially from what it sounds like at the Nobby conference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, when I when I get my mind set to do something, I guess I can get right after it. But running my mouth, running my mouth has always been very easy, as you can probably tell. <laughs> um, and, so, and the internet is a, such a powerful thing, right? And right here with your podcast that you're doing, you know, and reaching thousands and thousands of people, you know, this way, or I'm mean, with us for, for YouTube, just, just a website. I mean, so many things that we're doing today that I mean, we would not, if this had been 20 years ago or even 10 or 15 years ago, you know, where we were, you know, for, we would have been forced to send out paper catalogs and try to build a mailing list and, and advertise in the B journals and stuff. Building this would have been so much, it would have been so much of a slower process, you know, but the internet is just a powerful thing. It allows you to reach, I mean, with YouTube people like Cayman Reynolds and others, so many YouTubers have, they talk about us or, or have tested something, we, one of our products, or again, your format like you have here on the podcast, you know, it's just an easy, it's just so easy to reach so many people nowadays, which can be a, it's a really powerful thing for building a business. It can also be, you know, we got to really be careful because I daren't let, you know, I got to be really careful if, if any if I get somebody ticked off at me, 
you know, if we have a, if we have a <laughs> it failure, goes both you know, ways. If we fail somebody, <laughs> yeah, it can go the other way real fast. And so we really try. I mean, there, we certainly do make mistakes. We certainly do have issues from time to time with a product. And boy, I do whatever I can do to make sure that we take care of our customers because I cannot afford, I mean, it's just the right thing to do. First of all, taking care of customers, you know, but, but secondarily it's, I will, I cannot afford to have people bad mouthing us on the internet, you know, because it would be very, de- very devastating real quickly if it snowballs. Well, John, everybody's so understanding on the internet. I don't know <laughs> yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> right. Right. I will say though, if I may, beekeepers though are, are a really kind group of people and you both know that, you know, and so it's very understanding. They know what we're doing here. We're growing very fast. And so when we have some hiccups, generally speaking, people are just pretty awfully nice about it. Your equipment it's definitely shiny. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing. You started off with extractors. What else are you working on or what other types of equipment are you expanding into? A lot of different things. I, I, I tend to, I, I'm a little bit ADHD or maybe a lot of ADHD. I don't know. But, uh, well, you know, I've, my mind's always running 100 mile an hour, different, you know, different opportunities looking for, you know, what we can do, what, what products, what product needs are out there. What are beekeepers looking for? Where are the, where's the low hanging fruit, you know, in the industry? And again, just what do people need the most? And we find, you know, our stainless steel, whether it's extractors, honey tanks, storage tanks, uncapping tanks, heated bottling tanks, things like that, you know, have really, we've really seen a lot of opportunity there. There's other manufacturers out there, other distributors doing, you know, uh, making, uh, offering, making, selling, whatever great equipment. But we've really found, you know, on, on trying to trying to strike a balance that that suits the needs of particularly at this point in our business, hobbyists and sideliner beekeepers looking to fill some niches there. So we're working on some uncapping machine options, some better heated honey tank options, uh, unca- you know, just a lot of different things. We've got a lot of a lot of stuff in the works, and and it's hard because I say you know this is in the works, that's in the works, you know, uh, maybe a capping spinner or things like that. And so I got people once I once I mention something like that's in the works, <laughs> then I got people uh, on my case. You know, when's I gonna be ready? And uh, unfortunately, sometimes it's two or three years down the road because I've got a hundred different things in my head, and I'm only working on two or three. I might be working on ten at a time, but only two or three are really moving forward. So. I actually know a, a local beekeeper who's anxious for you to get a wax melter. So, yeah, that's something that might be sooner than might be sooner than later. I'll tease that. I mean, I'd say <laughs> when I say sooner, I'm talking probably by the end of the year, but probably not three years down the road either. Yeah, they're very good. There you go, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> What's the biggest challenge bringing this up to speed? I mean, you've grown so fast, and as you described, I mean, you're doing so much at one time. What's been the biggest challenge you've had to overcome? Yeah, it, is, it has been quite fast growth. A lot of times, really, finances are the biggest challenge. You know, I, I really would have thought, and this is where I'd say I'm still learning things every day, and I've learned so much in the past few years of being in this business. But, you know, I, I said to my wife, uh, you know, we, we have any business, right? Any business owner can relate to this. You have your ups and downs of your finances, right? And even when you have millions of dollars coming in, you have millions of dollars going out, too. And so... <laughs> And so, uh, and so, you know, I, I naively thought, you know, three or four years ago that by the time we got to that millions numbers, you know, that I would, you know, I wouldn't have these issues of, of inventory capital and, and just all the expenses that, you know, I mean, I knew it'd be expensive, but I thought, well, I'd always have plenty of money coming in, you know, it'd be fine and learn a hard way that, you know, your money problems are still there. You just have more zeros on them, you know, so $20,000 problem, is now $200,000 problem or, you know, whatever. And, you know, so it's still a struggle. I, I have to be really nice to my bankers and my investors. I have four silent partners that are, that are invested with me in the business here. And so I, again, mentioning people who were trusted in me from early on and have been helpful, that's they're, they're, they're part of that group too. And so, but anyway, you know, it's always, you know, interest rates are, are, are interesting these days. And so, but just, yeah, the growing pains, you know, and, and I mean, we, you know, I don't know if you've, either of you have followed, we posted a lot of videos last year as we bought this bakery property and, and have renovated it and stuff. And I thought, you know, we were in a 5,000 square foot building before that, uh, closer to 6,000 square foot building. And we moved to this building, which is about 25,000. And so five times as big, right? Almost. And I thought, I thought, I, I literally told people, I thought we'd be five to eight years before we have this <laughs> building full. So we moved into this, we bought it in November of 22. We moved into it in April of 23, just a little over a year ago. 
And by September of last year of 23, you know, so five or six months later, we were already building a 6,000 square foot addition, right? Which some of some some of your audience may have seen. We were posting pictures and videos of that. So, and we're looking at that now. We're saying, my, oh, my, what are we going to do for our long-term facilities, you know? And and again, this building that a year and a half ago I thought would last us for eight years, we're looking at it now like, okay, this is not going to work long-term. So what do we do? And so... Those things like that, it just it's just been quite a quite a journey, quite a, a, a roller coaster ride of just like, you know, my oh my, you know, everything keeps adding up and and uh, but it's it's so exciting at the same time, it's so fulfilling and and just and just a, a real blast, you know. Quite a roller coaster, I would think. It's very exhilarating and terrifying at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. Jenna, you know the biggest company in your hometown. We are not actually. You'd think though, maybe a town of two thousand people, but uh, we're we're getting to be there. We're getting there. But Caterpillar makes industrial construction equipment. They're headquartered in our area here in Central Illinois, and so there's around uh, around here. There's any number of smaller shops and factories that build custom parts for them, and so we have a couple of shops here in town, each of which employ probably fifty or seventy five people. So we're only up to twenty two employees, I think, right now. So we're not quite there yet, but we're working at it. Well, anybody who's been out to your website knows that you put a lot of time and energy into marketing the products, marketing Hilco. It's really commendable. Let me ask you directly, John, when I approach other beekeepers or we talk to beekeepers about the work that you're doing and the products you sell, I've been told Hilco products are fantastic. John's doing a great job, but the products are made in China. And they kind of like leave it at that. And it's like, well, there's a lot of things made in China. But I'm sure, I mean, my Apple computer that we're recording all this on is, is, <laughs> is made in China. Right. But how do you respond to that? Because it, that can be inflammatory in today's political environment. Absolutely. No, it's a fair question. And we do get that question. Sometimes people just ask where their product's made at. Uh, they ask, you know, why don't you have your parts made in the United States, whatever. So yeah, first of all, I'll say this. So as I mentioned earlier in our discussion here, we started out by having our extractors, we were basically taking off the shelf extractors from factories who were already building honey extractors in China. Okay. And uh, again, they were pretty good in a lot of ways. Uh, they were fairly well built. We ran into some issues there early on. And, you know, for the first year and a half or two, yeah, about the first year and a half, we were relying on China, China made machines that were just pretty much off the shelf. Well, sorry, in that same time period, this is the first few months or so we were just kind of using off the shelf. But as we got to 2021, we started to have them, we started throwing in our own ideas, having them customize stuff more to our liking adding a few different design elements that were suggested to us by our customers or just things I thought of myself or whatever. So, but then by the summer of 2021, we really started to see cracks in the system of, of this factory we're using where we're basically, again, having extractors shipped to us pretty much ready to go. We would check each one over, test run it and stuff, but there was just issues, mainly consistency issues. The overall quality was pretty good, but just, you know, they would just this shipment would have this on it, this shipment would have that on it, you know, and, and, and you know, they, they'd put a different motor controller on it all of a sudden or something that didn't really work very well. And so, so we realized that this was not going to, if we were going to be the number one, you know, distributor, manufacturer, seller, whatever, of honey extracting equipment in America, or even if we're not we're number one, even if we're one of the best, we wanted to be the best we could be. And by the way, we do think we're number one right now, as I don't think anybody's selling more extractors and equipment in the United States than we are as the stainless steel. So, if I can brag a little bit there, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, we wanted to be the best that we could be. And so what we've been doing for the last couple of years now is in, in summer of 2021, we started working with a different manufacturer over there and have them start kind of building parts custom for us. And then we assemble them here in house. And so that's what we, we worked, started working on in the summer of 21. We launched that lineup in about April of 22, about two years ago, which is more or less the current lineup we have now. And it's, it's, it's improved somewhat, but it's largely the same designs as we've been doing for the last couple of years now. And so we've built a shop. We have a team of five or six guys in our shop right now that all they do all day long is build honey extractors and build equipment from the parts that are made for us overseas. So we say assembled and engineered and assembled in the USA. So we're designing the stuff over here. 
we're assembling it here and we and we intentionally do you know there's a lot of things assembly wise that i can have the chinese do for me and they want to do for me you know that we insist on doing here because i want to make sure the product is done well you know it's not it, yes it, we we rely a lot on made in china i will absolutely admit that that being said i mean you know people like the price points that we are at on this stuff and i, I just gotta say i mean it's just it's, i mean i think most everybody can understand that's how we reach those price points is we have to rely on foreign labor force. You know, if I were using you entirely U.S. made stuff, my prices would be at least twice as high, maybe three times high in some cases, higher in some cases, which, you know, and I fully respect, you know, I'm an American too. I want our country to succeed. I can fully respect the made in USA mantra. And we try to do some of that as much of it as we can, but you know, in order to hit the price point we're trying to hit and, and reach the target mark we're trying to hit, we have to rely on that overseas. But we put a lot of effort into checking over this stuff, making sure it's done right. And believe me, it causes a lot of headaches, but we keep plowing on. We try to, you know, when we have an issue, we back with solid customer service. We put a great warranty in this stuff. That's the story. That's just the way it is. That, I will say, if I can, one more thing, though. I mean, we're not married to China. We're having some stuff made in Turkey right now. Um, we're starting to switch to Turkey into a Turkish manufacturer on some stuff. We're actually, we're also talking to a Mexico manufacturer. And again, we're also trying to start to make some small stuff ourselves here, too. So, you know, we're trying to diversify. We're trying to not rely on China as much, but it's somewhat the reality. Right. Well, that's not just you, but it's the, the the entire world relies so much on Chinese made goods. So, well, thank you for sharing that with us. I have a quick question about questions. So if you sell B equipment, you get B questions. How's that going for you? More of our B questions come from local customers, you know, so we have you know, about the vast majority of our business, so over 90% is is shipping nationwide, you know, customers all over the country, even in Canada, some, the Caribbean, some, et cetera. But, you know, a relatively small percentage, probably five to 10% of our customer, of our, of our business is here locally. And we love these local customers. These are the same people who helped us get started four years ago. And so, yeah, the majority of our beekeeping questions typically come from the local base that's here in a store or ordering bees for pickup. You know, it can be really interesting, you know, because we'll have customers who, you know, they've, they've, they've dropped a thousand dollars or better on a couple of hives worth of product and bees and everything, and they can come get their bees. And it's clear they haven't done any research yet. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, oh boy, you know, okay, I, I hope this goes well. So you give them a quick crash course on how to install their package and what to do in the first few weeks. And, and send them on their way, and you just hope they do some research, you know, and sorry, I'm being kind of blunt here, but yeah, we don't get a ton of beekeeping questions from our nationwide customers, but occasionally do, especially when it comes to honey processing and stuff, and we just uh, just tell them what we know. What you've been able to achieve in such a short time is, is amazing. I think it's taken many people by surprise. You've raised a lot of eyebrows around the country. <laughs> <Thank> and, <you. laughs> yeah, and I mean that in a good way, of course. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just going to ask if there's anything we haven't covered that you wanted to make sure our listeners knew about you or Hilco. Oh, not too much. It's been it's been a lot of fun talking here. I think, you know, the exciting part, I think, is that we're just barely getting started. It really, really keeps me going every day when things get go a little bit south once in a while. And I, generally, it's not. Generally, every day is just a lot of fun. But, you know, we just have got so many things. We feel like we're barely scratching the surface of our potential in this industry. But that's just a really exciting place to be. And so there's, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of great beekeepers out there who are hungry for more of what we have to offer. And so we're just trying to offer more and more product and more service. We're hoping to eventually have more stores around the country. So it's just just a, a lot of exciting stuff. Just just stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to keep up with you. You're going at light speed, and I look forward to catching up with you in January at Nabi in 2025. We'll have to get together because the January 2nd is my birthday, so that's the kickoff of Nabi. So we'll have to have a. Sp- <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to Cayman about having a special. We should a- absolutely. For a guy like you, why not? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut this part out of the episode. <laughs> no, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> yeah, the editor prerogative. But John, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show today. I think you're doing a bang up job. And I will say, in full disclosure, I did buy a bottling tank from you earlier this year. And it's working. And I, I paid full price. It, it's no exchange here or service. It is working flawlessly. And I really enjoy it. And it's made my bottling a lot easier than out of the plastic five-gallon bucket. Yes, it will do that. It will do that. I'm glad it's working out. Thank you so much, Jeff. Take care, and we'll catch up with you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Becky. You as well. Thank you, John. 
I'm tired, Becky. I'm glad that we were all sitting and I wasn't holding a microphone trying to keep up with him if we're walking around his display. I don't know that anybody's ever made me feel so lazy. I mean, I thought I had energy and was a go-getter and got things done. And now I just feel like, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life now after that <laughs> experience? <laughs> I've wasted my life. <laughs> had I gone faster, I could have gotten more done. <laughs> Such great energy. And he was just so willing to share the good and the bad, which was was really interesting to hear whether or not you love bees. I mean, that was just an interesting business interview. John's working hard to get where he's at, and he's putting a lot of energy into to being successful and making his customer, beekeepers, happy and make the beekeepers successful. And it's really hard to uh, put that down. Kudos to John and, and those who are like him shaking up the business. It's better for us. Beekeepers need people with that kind of energy trying to support them, and that's what he's trying to do, so that's exciting. I mean, exhausting, but exciting, right? (laughs) And that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to follow us and rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on the reviews along the top of any web page. We want to thank our regular episode sponsors, Better Bee, Global Patty, Strong Microbials, and Northern Bee Books for their generous support. Finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to leave us questions and comments at the Leave a Comments section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.